You're listening to The Secret to My Success, an interview style podcast that asks our guests what trait, skill, or characteristic they possess that's made them a success. Hosted by Shelby Skirhawk. So Mariana, did uh, back in the day, um, what was your, uh, your first cell phone? What brand was it? Was it a razor? Was it a big old flip phone? My first. It wasn't a big uh-huh. flip phone. It was a small flip phone because I didn't get one until college. My mom had one of those giant bricks, like the original cell phones. Okay. I yeah, the 80s one. I feel like it was a Nokia because they did most of those phones. I feel like it was a Nokia. Yeah. So Nokia certainly owned uh, owned the space there. I certainly remember my, um, my beloved Razor phone. Um, I think I had some Ericsson's and I had some Nokia's and, uh, but I, the very first one I had that really was my mom's that I would take out with me when I was, um, you know, going out on the weekend, um, I would take her big Motorola flip phone oh, that the yeah. battery would always slip out. <laughs> Yeah, slip out of my purse, those. and then I would miss the call, and she'd be furious with me, and I'd be like, "But the battery fell out," and that was a valid excuse, but it was, but it wasn't. But that's another story. The um, the reason why I bring up Nokia though is because our uh, our guest today, a gentleman by the name of Alan Adamson, he's got a new book. Uh, it's called Shift Ahead: How the Best Companies Stay Relevant in a Fast Changing World. And so he's got, I mean, he is just a, a wealth of information about um, how many, many companies have successfully navigated a transition and how many companies have not. And so the example he uses is Nokia versus Apple. So Nokia was very much the market leader before Apple came onto the market. And Nokia was very set in their ways and thinking that there's no way that people are going to navigate away from a physical keyboard, that people want buttons. They're not going to tap Mm -hmm. on their phone into a tiny little keyboard um, where when you press on the keys, if you press too far one way or the other way, it gives you the wrong letter. You remember those, those struggles, like when you first started. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. I was like, I'm never going to get this. This thing is terrible. Well, of course now, you know, nobody uses the the keyboard phone anymore. All of it's a an electronic, a virtual keyboard. But but Nokia saw this coming, and they anticipated people's desires wrong. They um they simply ignored that type of technology, and they you know famously got left behind. And so mm-hmm. the the argument that Alan makes is that there's a lot of examples of companies that miss blaring red red flags. And um, and he actually talks about some of the most prevalent red, red flags in a company's demise a lot of times. So Alan goes through these seven red flags and, and we talk about each one of those in this episode. I mean, they, they cover basic things like basic math. I mean, a, a CEO not looking at the right numbers, maybe looking at um, income versus actual profits or uh, just, just realizing that they're not, they don't really truly have their, their pulse on what's happening uh, with their own numbers. Maybe it's another company that uh, competes on mm-hmm. price and not different, different, differentiation. Um, And he uses the example of uh, Campbell's that for the longest time, they thought they were fine because the revenue was staying the same or slightly increasing, but that's because they were just raising their prices and um, they weren't responding to what the market wanted was for younger millennial um, consumers. They wanted fresh ingredients. So they weren't necessarily buying food from cans and, and consuming that. And so, so yeah. Alan goes into all of these different red flags, but the ones that I found most fascinating were how they apply to our personal brand. So of course the, the personal brand is a little bit of a buzzword, but it just simply means that in this new world of work where all of us are, um, are individual commodities, we're not necessarily cogs in the corporate uh, machine anymore. 
that a lot of times, even if you are in a corporate position, um, you would probably consider yourself a little bit of a, um, an entrepreneur, somebody that, that thinks, uh, very, very ahead, very, um, independently as if this was your own company, as if the department was your own, your own company and, Mm -hmm. uh, applying that same position to your, your personal pursuits. So whether it's freelancing or taking on, uh, you know, clients for consulting or any different types of, um, entries into the U economy, uh, the thing that, that Alan talks about is that you've got to realize that the same red flags that, that, hinder companies, uh, not keeping up with the numbers, um, not differentiating yourself, uh, realizing that, um, that you're too deep into your comfort zone. All of those things are, are the same principles for our own selves. Oh man. Just one more thing for me to pay attention to, to see seriously, seriously. I know. I know. So in this interview, we talk about those seven red flags that he uses uh, corporate examples of companies that have navigated a shift into into a newer market or a new space uh, very well and some of those that haven't. And then he applies all of those red flags to our own personal brand and how the same mistakes that com- that corporations make a lot of times are the same mistakes that we may set we ourselves may make. And so he uh, gives a great outline and a great uh, kind of red flag navigator to be able to succeed in the U economy or the gig economy and, um, and bring a little bit of extra self-awareness to what we're doing to realize that resting on your laurels, um, resting on, on the very last great thing that you created and not continuing to push yourself and to change and to learn and basically have this growth mindset that we talk about so much that, that's the same downfall that companies face and that we have to face it as individuals too. It's such a cliche to say that the world is changing at an ever faster rate. I mean, of course it is. And if you haven't already felt that that push or sense of urgency in your industry, either it's from competition or your coworkers or, or simply realizing you there's so much that you don't know, then maybe you have maybe you have been left behind and you do need to hear how fast industries are evolving. My guest today has studied both the successful shifts that companies make to stay relevant and then that severe inertia that infects companies who don't. Alan Adamson is a branding expert and author of three books, including Brand Simple, Brand Digital, and his latest, Shift Ahead, How the Best Companies Stay Relevant in a Fast-Changing World. In his extensive research and numerous interviews with company executives, he's found that the secret to success for staying not only afloat, but staying relevant is shifting ahead of what he has found these seven red flags for irrelevancy. Alan, thank you so much for joining me. Pleasure. Thanks for inviting me. So I want to start by talking about the research that went into the book and and the hundred or so interviews that you did. with executives about organizations that successfully shifted these, these changing waters and then those that, that didn't. So my question as someone who interviews people for a living, I mean, you conducted these interviews with executives whose, whose companies either past or, or present have done well either, or have done, have, have fallen behind the times. So did you find or did you have difficulty uh, getting past anybody's kind of vague answers or, or, or even defensiveness about uh, what the, the rights and the wrongs were to, to really get to that, that, that core nugget that you're looking for? Yeah, yeah, we went into this saying, gee, I, I was getting more and more calls when I was running a company saying, can you help me? And I would listen to the uh, prospect tell me their challenges. And I realized that marketing and traditional 
tools would not help them. They'd become their father's Oldsmobile. Mm -hmm. So there was nothing to do. There was no way to spin it just or put, as the famous saying goes, lipstick on a pig. Mm -hmm. You know, they're, they're, they had become irrelevant. So I said, was it just me or more and more companies, organizations? Because we did big companies, small companies, uh, profits, nonprofits. Um, and so we went out and, and did a lot of a lot of work for some companies, as you said, had successfully shifted ahead, and many more that had have become roadkill, if you will. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, and um, the, the you know most macro finding was that there was no easy. If you do these three things, you'll be fine. Yeah. There were there are lots of ways companies can fall behind, or organizations, or people. Uh, there was no magic potion that all you need to do is do three push-ups in the morning and you'll live forever. Uh, but I, we found that the the mistakes, if you could avoid lots of the obvious mistakes, and people sort of know many of them, you would stand a better chance to stay relevant than if you fell into one of the many, many, many road traps. Right. Um, so, um, you know, the other thing, as you said in your opening, is that um, – we thought, is the world really changing faster or is it just technology and Silicon Valley and everything else is just going fine? Uh, and the change is happening across industries, yeah. across categories. So, yes, if you're in technology, you realize that if you're here today, it doesn't mean you'll be here tomorrow. <laughs> but obviously the media business, uh, the book business, you know, so many businesses are being challenged. Well, so often a company's problems are I guess the result of maybe the team's symptoms. So in some cases, I mean, sure, there there's always going to be people that just simply fall behind the times and, and don't really care to keep up. But you know, kind of the can't teach a, an old dog new tricks. But but what about the the well-meaning people that um, end up contributing to the problem and not the solution? Like, what are some of the reasons that that happens? Yeah, and you know that was a starting point in terms of red flags, the thing to watch for. You, the, the most one of the most important findings we think we found is that you just realize a how hard this is, and realize that it's human nature. You know, the uh, most people sit in the in Marty Crane's chair yeah. from the old TV show Frasers. Yeah. Uh, they they are they are much more comfortable with the familiar, and no matter where you are, it's easier to do what you did yesterday than try something new today. And so I think one of the key findings is realize that we're all sitting in Marty Crane's chair. <laughs> and if we don't get out of it, uh, then no amount of uh, uh, no amount of other things are going to matter. So the individual needs to realize that human nature is to be more comfortable yeah. with the past is sort of the starting point. And that many of us operate on what we call, you know, cruise control. Um, you know, I was recently teaching one of my uh, teenagers to drive, and I recalled, you know, they were very preoccupied with, you know, you know hooking up the phone, the radio, and and tuning yeah. in the radio stations, and letting the car do most of it. But I recall, you know, when I was learning to drive, I learned how to drive on something called a stick shift, but no one really knows what that <laughs> is anymore. But you had to really pay attention to the sound of the engine. You had different gears for different, and you know. But most most people run their lives and their business as if they're on cruise right. control. They're just driving down the highway and you know, sort of paying attention. But the car's zipping along. They're not really sure how it all works, and really not. You know, the windows are closed, and they, you know, they, the air conditioning's on, and they're they're not that much in touch with what's going on on the road unless somebody jumps in front of them. But, you know, and that's the way a lot of people approach their personal business that, you know, this is what I did yesterday. I'm on cruise control and this is what's helped me succeed for the past 10 years. And I'll just keep on doing it. And those two recipes of, you know, it's worked for me in the past. It ain't broken. Don't fix it. And, you know, yesterday was comfortable and tomorrow I'm not going to do something different are the number one and two, you know, red flags to say that if you have this personally going on in your life, uh, you are, uh, it should be uh, warning Will Robinson should be flashing on your dashboard because right. uh, you're going to get into trouble. <laughs> well, so in those interviews, then you, you gathered stories and you did find kind of seven basic categories of, of red flags. So in talking about these red flags, I mean, there's certainly personal lessons that, that we can learn from them um, to really become our own brands. So I, I want to go through them. But, you know, of course, with this focus on individuals. So like how can employees, um, entrepreneurs, solopreneurs, like how can they recognize their behavior and these red flags? You started to touch on this before that, you know, just realizing that that 
comfort is human nature, but I guess what, what are some of the very first things you can do to, to get yourself out of that comfort zone and realize that, you know, life is happening right now, change is happening right now. And so how do you make, um, how do you make yourself kind of push forward and not be the problem and be part of the solution? Hmm. Well, one of the more basic ones, which spoke to, um, we spoke to a lot of companies and I actually experienced, I was at uh, Unilever early in my career and they make Dove soap and other packaged goods. And I remember talking a lot in meetings about how important it is to look at the consumer. But I recall that lots of my time was not so much focused on what people were doing at home with Dove mm -hmm. soap. Um, but, you know, what did P&G do last week and what did Colgate? So I began, became preoccupied with the um, uh, competition. When I worked with Pepsi, they were fixated yeah. on Coke. Um, and, you know, one of the characteristics we called it, you know, too many people play tennis and knock off. And what I mean by that uh, is that when you're playing tennis, and I do both badly, <laughs> you know, part of the game is to watch where your opponent is and really focus on your opponent and hit where they're not. Yeah. <laughs> uh, if you're playing golf badly um, or well, uh, yes, you have to worry about who you're playing with, but you really have to pay more attention to the ball, the wind, you know, what you're trying yeah. to do. And so lots of companies spend forever focused on their direct competitors. And most disruption happens from the side or from behind. And so that also applies to individuals. You know, you're looking at people very much like you. You're in a certain bubble of people that are behaving the same way. And you're saying, well, I'm doing what everyone else is doing. Um, and you're, you're, you're playing tennis. You're really focused on people that are very similar to you or companies like Coke following Pepsi. And in the end, Coke is not going to lose. Uh, Pepsi is not going to lose to Coke. It, if the Colo category continues to decline, right. it, it's, you know, Pepsi is going to lose to, um, somebody that they didn't even think about. And I think the same is true for the individual. That's, that's interesting. I like that uh, phrase that uh, playing tennis and, or playing, whether you're playing tennis or golf and that you really should be playing a little bit more golf. You know, tied to that is a notion of, you know, looking at the world and this is an old term, but many companies uh, looked at the world, what's called very myopically. They just saw themselves. So we spoke to the folks at National Geographic and um, a brand I grew up with and I love. And, you know, when we talked to them, I said, you know, tell me how you, what happened? And they almost disappeared and it's, they're going to survive now, but they came really close to disappearing because they saw themselves as a magazine brand. Uh, even though down the street uh, was Discovery and they were doing the same sort of thing about uh, nature and stories uh, and they were a, a, a cable brand. Uh, so they almost didn't make it because they saw themselves in the magazine business and not looked at what their strengths were and their strengths were, you know, understanding nature, understanding the environment and say, you know, so if, if we have this strength of really understanding, what else can we do with it? And I think it's a really good story to apply to the individual. So they said, well, what are we really good at? We're really good at, you know, explaining the environment and nature. And so they formed a joint venture with a, a cruise company called Lynn Black Cruises. And now instead of just reading National Geographic magazine and looking at nice pictures, which no right. one does anymore, even if you do it online, you know, you can get on a National Geographic boat and you can go with them to Alaska. And when you're in Alaska, you can have National Geographic photographers help you take the perfect picture of the grizzly or the whale, whether you're using an iPhone or you're using an expensive camera. You have National Geographic naturalists take you on walks uh, and explain what's going on and be with you. And so you have a National Geographic experience. And so when you go home, uh, you know, you will quickly tweet and say, gee, I had to, you know, look at this picture I took of the whale and I took it on my National Geographic experience. So the same skill sets they've always had are now being deployed in a more relevant way. And I think the same holds true for individuals. What are your strengths? What are you really good at? And if the way you've always done it is some way zoom out, become less myopic. Another thing National Geographic did, they had this long relationship with Jane Goodall, who, you know, was one of the first to understand gorillas and, uh, how they communicate and how human-like they are. And they would always, you know, run nice stories in the magazine, but they finally realized, boy, this is a really powerful story. Why don't we make mm -hmm. a movie out of it? And this year they released uh, a movie uh, called Jane and it did phenomenally well at the box office for yeah. a documentary. And it was an example of, you know, just looking at their strengths and saying, why do I have to constantly, even though I'm a magazine person, <laughs> serve it up only in the magazine? What are my strengths? And how might I reimagine that um, without the constraints 
of being myopic. Okay, so I have to I have to talk about success because <clears throat> I came from um a uh, 12 years at Success Magazine and the 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 issues there are similar. So um so Success itself is a uh, more than 100-year-old brand. Um and so mm -hmm. in that way it was very similar to National Geographic. I'd attended a conference in New York about um, about the media industry, and uh, one of the one of the the case studies was National Geographic, how they were able to shift from a magazine, um, not just a magazine, but also really uh, double down on their digital and their social media, and they are killing it in social media. I mean, you know, the Instagram stories, and um, basically they just hand over their Instagram feeds to uh, to their photographers because I mean they're on the front lines, and so you really get that behind the 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 scenes experience uh, of National Geographic uh, much much better than I think many magazines do. So the the challenge with Success Magazine has always been that it's been a magazine brand and it's stayed there. And my my role in in um, you know creating digital content and creating web content um, and the social media was I think one we were very late to it very, very late to it. And um, we were trying to, I think, create an entire parallel brand for digital with a fourth of the staff of, of uh, the print brand. So I'm sure that's, those are some of the challenges you hear often. Uh, but uh, yeah, the publishing industry is, is really kind of a, a fascinating case study. Yeah, and they almost National Geographic, as you know, got lucky because so many people subscribed. They weren't an ad-based publication, so they had plenty of time. But they almost didn't make it. They had to be broken up, and they came within inches yeah. of disappearing. Um, and tied to another cri criteria, most people reinvent themselves or think about this when it's too late. You know, most of the organizations that failed realized they needed to change, but by the time they got serious about it. Uh, it was too late. It was too late in terms of the market had moved, or more importantly, it was too late. You know, they didn't have the strength anymore to do it. They didn't have the money. Yeah. They were bleeding. And you know, part of success is is moving when you're strong and in fit and in good condition, not when you're so ill that you know your every meeting is about you know who are you going right. to cut back on. Right. The same is true for the individuals. Um, you know, you need to um, dis when you decide to do something, do it. When business is good, you know, the the the, the other um, it goes to the we had a great conversation um, with the folks at Marriott. And part of what May Marriott was uh, to, able to shift ahead over these many years is their founder, Bill, uh, Bill Marriott, said, you know, his view was success is never final. And the, if you wait till the sky is falling, you, you know, uh, in your own life, it's really hard, yeah. even if you have the right idea. To have enough stamina, because uh, yeah, most that's, people that's start absolutely too late. true. So, uh, so let's let's go through some of these red flags, and uh, the first one being uh, basic math. So, I mean, this one comes down to you know revenue and expenditure numbers. But what is the significance um, of this red flag for individuals, both Lee, both employees in, in an organization, and then also just uh, solopreneurs that are out on their own? Yeah, I, I think yeah. So the, the the Campbell story was one of many. For, and again, usually it's not one thing that causes a company to run into trouble. It's, it's never just oh, all you have to do is X, and never with just one thing, but a lot of things. But for Campbells, there were a series of years they were going through, and you know they would present and they show revenue rising, and Wall Street said, "Great, you know, money's going up. You must be doing something right." Um, but of course, the story was not that revenue was, yes, revenue was rising, but unit cans sold of soup was declining and they were just increasing the price. So, and I think individuals do the same thing that, yeah, I'm doing okay, this is happening, but they're not really yeah. being honest with themselves <laughs> uh, that, that, no, you are becoming irrelevant. And because it's always good to say, well, you know, people just like the comfort of saying, well, I'm doing this. Look, I've done this. And so the Campbell Soup story, they, you know, they showed Wall Street. Years of um, of uh, of increasing sales, while people bought you know, fewer and fewer cans of soup, or people spent far less time in a right. supermarket in the aisle to begin with. So um, the individual thing happens the same way. You know, you know, 
gee, I'm still doing this, this, and this, and, you know, things are going to be okay. Because people generally try yeah. to be optimistic. <laughs> and uh, oftentimes, you know, asking a friend to to tell you what they see in you is a more accurate because if, if uh, a, you know, if they're comfortable sharing bad news, because you, you're, you're too close to the forest exactly. to see exactly. the trees. Well, um, then you touch a little bit on uh, Red Flag 2, which is uh, – Competing on price, not differentiation. So uh, Campbell Soup, again, they were just kind of trying to compete on the price. Now, it was the opposite, though, because Campbell's was increasing. Yeah. Right. Usually what happens is, you know, you start lowering the price and people still buy you. But ultimately, if they if the only reason people buy you, it's an old marketing. If you if if I'm going to work for less, <laughs> you know, and people will buy me. But ultimately, they'll buy a better value. And that requires delivering more. And so if you start finding yourself needing to lower your price because people won't pay more, it's often a result of, I can't see mm -hmm. the difference, so why should I pay for it? And if people can't see a difference in what you do as an individual, um, then they won't be interested in paying for you. Right. So it's a matter of, of differentiating yourself and I guess differentiating right. your, your skills, I guess having the self-awareness to know what you're good at and what you're not and and you know, even right. maybe double downing on, on those things that you're really great at that maybe yeah. are more unique from others. Yeah, we had a great conversation when we started the book. It's, you know, we did some research as to is the world really changing faster? And we uh, had the opportunity to chat with uh, Tom Friedman, who's a columnist for The Times. Yeah. And he talked about the, the macro factors. We all know uh, Moore's Law, which is about technology getting faster every 18 months and climate change and globalization. But the other phrase that stuck with me from our conversation is his notion that average is over. And many people, you know, used to get by doing averagely. But now if everyone competes on a global scale and everyone's connected, average no longer works. So for the individual, average is over is a really critical lesson as well. Because uh, if you do five things sort of okay, yeah. there'll be five people who do those five individual things better. Uh, right. What success is, as you know, and everyone else knows, it's easier said than done, is pick the one or two things that you're going to be great at uh, and focus on that and get better and better at that as opposed to continuing to check the box and saying, I'm doing this, I do this okay, I, I write pretty good reports, I'm a pretty nice person, I do pretty good presentations, I'm pretty creative. You know, those are all used to be okay because many categories you could get by and just showing up and being average. But average is over in business and it's certainly over uh, for the individual, unfortunately. Yeah, I like that. I like that phrase. Uh, the, the, the next red flag that you talk about in the book uh, being big on data and short on analysis. So, of course, you know, this one, I see it relates to the first red flag, but uh, the onus is on the person that's that's kind of seeing these numbers that you say uh, in the book that often uh, CEOs don't look at or don't want to look at the, the right numbers for their business. So as we talk about our individual selves, I mean, say that you are a solopreneur and You've got a website and you've got, um, you know, you have metrics that you can measure yourself on. Uh, what's, what's the, the real danger in just thinking that in your ignorance is bliss and um, realizing uh, or not realizing that you're not really growing? Yeah. Yeah. It, 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 one of the, my favorite stories on this is that we were doing some, this is not in the book, but we we're doing some research on the pizza business. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, we worked with uh, Pizza Hut at uh, many years ago, and they they showed all sorts of research of how many how much people liked their pizza, and they mm -hmm. were looking at lots of data that people thought it was good tasting. They liked the cheese, you know, and they were all feeling really good. And then um, the research person I was working with did a clever thing. They went out and went out talked to those same consumers, and they said, you know, if I told you the Pizza Hut was going out of business and wouldn't be here tomorrow, what would you do? And everyone said, no big deal. I would just use, you know, yeah. Um, dominoes and yeah. and so they realized that even though people were giving them sort of okay marks yeah. at the end of the day they didn't care about them right. <laughs> you know it was you know not that big a deal you know and so so they were giving them the answers they wanted to hear and data but when it came time to the big picture stepping back and saying you know do you matter to people right they didn't matter and so i think the same is true with the individual i do okay here i do well here you ask people you get good scores across but you know do you matter and finding the right insight, the right aha? Because sometimes you need to step back from the data to say, well, 
let me ask the, the million dollar question. You know, I could do all these things right, put the right cheese on, the right crust, right oven, right delivery. But at the end of the day, people don't really care and feel that, you know, there's no difference between one brand and the other. Um, then uh, you get in trouble. Yeah, absolutely. And so don't lose, don't let, don't, don't get persuaded by a bunch of positive numbers to mean, to think that you're, uh, you're uh, heading to home base. You can certainly uh, make numbers do what you want them to do sometimes. Exactly. Uh, well, speaking of pizza then, um, in red flag number four, it's uh, you talk about neglecting table stakes. And the example you use is uh, Domino's. Can you explain yeah. what these table stakes are? Yeah. So the, 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 the flip side of that story is the, the, the famous Domino's, which is if you're going to be in a category, you know, you can focus on your difference. In their case, they were focusing on, I think, speed of delivery. Mm -hmm. And that's an important, that was important. But they had totally neglected the table stakes, which is, you know, yes, fast is important. And I want the pizza by the time I, you know, double click, it should be, somebody should be ringing my doorbell. <laughs> but they found out that, you know, what was being delivered was tasting more and more like cardboard. Yeah. So so the CEO that came in to try to turn it around, which did a pretty good job shifting him ahead, said, you know, forget delivery. Yes, well, but we need to get the basics. We need to make sure our pizzas taste better than everybody. And then getting them fast will be more relevant. So, so you know, sometimes in an effort to, you know, focus on your key point of differentiation, uh, you neglect table stakes. And to some extent, that makes it harder on the individual because even though you may be the best best analytical person the company can hire, you, you need to, you know, hit some table stakes. You can't be a total perhaps geek sitting in the corner with a pocket protector. You need to fit into the culture of the organization. Mm -hmm. You know, there are other things you need to do. So in, in your effort to be the best at one thing, you can't just be the best delivery and not have the right pie. Right, right. Well, so we're we're going uh, going through, of course, the the seven red flags, and uh, the fifth one I, I found fascinating. It's pride often goes before a fall, and this one I, I think this one is is important because it um, well it had to do with arrogance and not believing that the competition poses a threat, and the example you use is Nokia versus Apple. Where do where do we fall in this? Well, how can how how does our pride and again our our self image of of what we think we do well um, stand in the way of of really greatness? Yeah, I think it's a really big red flag. And um, the the there were a couple of stories we did. You know, when the, the folks at uh, Nokia looked at Apple phones when they first go, you know, our phone is you know eighty eight dollars. Why would somebody pay three hundred dollars for a phone? Well, that too shall pass. Yeah. Won't happen. Same thing happened with uh, another organization we spoke to, which was BlackBerry. Um, mm. And I was a heavy BlackBerry uh, 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 addict, and <laughs> yep. uh, never thought my thumbs could work any other screen but a keyboard. But when we spoke to folks there. There were again, there were many reasons. But the number one reason that um, BlackBerry probably disappeared was that their leadership team totally believed people would never give up their keyboards, that people would never take a flat screen iPhone music box as serious. Yeah. So they never, they saw Apple right in front of them and they said, yeah, you know, it's a fad. It's a, you know, it, you know, BlackBerry is a serious business tool and people are never going to give up there. And so they had that arrogance. And I think that's really important for the individual. When people think they're good, they know what they're doing. They're the top of the pack and, you know, I'm never going to be challenged. No one's ever going to replace me. I'm perfect. Um, you know, that's, that should be probably the number one red flag yeah. saying once you feel that, you know, you're, you're, you know, you also close down to new ideas and you stop paying attention to what's going around because you say, I'm, I'm, I'm king of the hill. Yeah, absolutely. Well, um, moving on to red flag six, and we, we talked about this uh, before, but it's being too deep in your comfort zone. And this, of course, speaks very much to, to individuals. Why are comfort zones just so dangerous? Um, because people are in a bubble, you know, they, they like to surround themselves with people that agree with them. Yeah. <laughs> and, um, and you see that happening in, in social media that, uh, you know, one of the, you know, they're just comfortable with a quiet, um, yes, you're great. This is fine. Keep doing it. And we found that organizations that were pretty good at shifting ahead tended to have, um, 
management teams that came from different places. They all didn't go to the same school. They all didn't, you know, grow up in the same town. That organizations that are pretty good at shifting ahead, you know, tended to have an ability to look at the world through multiple perspectives mm. and not be in the bubble that reflects back everything they believe in, in their ecosystem. And the same with the individual. If you want to uh, shift ahead personally, you know, our advice, my advice would be, you know, get out of your comfort zone, get out of, um, get out of the, you know, shop in a different place, have coffee in a different place, <laughs> you know, go to a different neighborhood, go to a different movie, you know, get out of your routine, because if it's too close in that bubble, you're not going to be exposed to changes that are soon going to run you right. over. Well, and I think this also has an application to the uh, the information that we expose ourselves to. I mean, Ed, there's there's been a lot of talk about social media and, um, you know, the, of course, Facebook shift to put the the um, focus on individuals and less than um, than organizations and, and news outlets a lot of uh, a lot of times because of the fake news. But it, there is there does lie a, a risk though that if you immerse yourself in um, only the information that that you agree with only the the topics that you're interested in and you ignore the rest of the world then you are only seeing a very small picture of of a, a small view of the big picture right exactly one quick story when I was coming out of business school and interviewing for my first job and I went through the eight interviews at this ad mm -hmm. agency and i thought i knew everything about marketing i finally met with the ceo at the time uh, ken roman and uh, i thought this is it i mean yeah i'm gonna try to impress him with as much how much i know about marketing and advertising and brands and i'm ready for what is his first question going to be and his first question is so alan uh, you had a good day huh? yeah so tell me about the last book mm -hmm. you read alan and why do you found it interesting and i book i mean, I mean not a marketing <laughs> right. book and so I, he said, tell me about the last movie you went to and why did you find it? And, and, and then, so I was really yeah. off guard. And afterwards uh, I said, you know, Ken, why did you, why did we spend half an hour of our 40 minutes together talking about, you know, books, movie, theater, yeah. travel. And he said, well, look, I want our people to be the eyes and ears for our clients. And, you know, to do that, they need to be in touch with what's going on in the world. And I've never forgot that lesson. And I think to shift ahead, um, you you know, the, the broader you are, when we spoke to some futurists in terms of predicting what's coming next, they tend to look at the edges. They don't really dig deep. They, they zoom wide. And I think the individual who stays in touch uh, with what's going around has a better shot of keeping relevant and shifting ahead than the individual who is the right. expert at just one thing, but it's very narrow and not in touch with what's happening sure. in the bigger picture. So finally, the uh, the seventh red flag is um, that Yertle the turtle is left behind. Now, I don't know Yertle. You said it's a Dr. Seuss, but it's 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 escaped me. So how are we like Yertle? Well, you know, Yertle wanted to, you know, to some extent be king, and he kept on asking people to pile him out. The other thing is he tried to get so high so he could uh -huh. see everything. And, you know, one of the lessons learned we, we, we had there is that seeing what's around the corner is really hard, but lots of people can tell what's coming. We all know driverless cars are coming. We all know that uh, certain changes are coming, but the issue right. is when. <laughs> and so, you know, we can all try to get on top of somebody else and figure out what's around the corner, but success is not only figuring out what will happen, but when it's going to happen. And the when part is really tricky because we always can assume, oh, that will never happen. And we just sit and watch it. And then by the time it does happen, uh, we're often yeah. just watching it. Well, uh, before I let you go, I do have a couple of quick hit questions for you if you're ready. Yeah. All right. So what's the very last thing that uh, that you've learned? The last thing I've learned is um, that the more time I spend on email, the less in touch with reality I'm, oh, yeah. I'm at. My phone broke yesterday. <laughs> um, and I had to go through a day in New York City without a without an iPhone. Oh my. <laughs> and I thought, oh my God, how am I gonna do this? And I, I did more good thinking, more talk to more people. I had a meeting with somebody. I wasn't like dying to see what's on my phone or I wasn't being pinged. Right. So it was refreshing to remind me that 
sometimes uh, just clicking from one thing to the other is not the best way to engage with what's in front of your nose. Yeah, that's a really good lesson. Uh, what's the very worst piece of advice you've ever gotten? Um, oh, wait it out. Things will get better. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, usually when things are heading south, waiting and just grinning and bearing it, it's never, yeah. you know, uh, helped me. What movie can you absolutely quote by heart? Oh, goodness. That's a great, uh, great question. I, you know, probably um, uh, one of the classics uh, since I, you know, um, actually the movies I can quote by heart are the ones my kids forced me to watch 25,000 <laughs> yeah, times. So, you know, I can probably rewrite the incredible script and, yep. you know, Toy Story uh, because I saw those movies uh, all delightful. I never saw them once. Yes. I, I, if I saw them 25 times, it was probably a good, a, a good movie. Oh gosh, I know. <laughs> and finally, from, from your research, from your, um, from your personal experience and, and, and your personal knowledge, what would you say your secret to success is? Uh, I think curiosity, you know, I, you know, you got to go through life and you ever wonder why this happens. And if you're not curious about I mean, how, how do they do that? How do they make the car? How do they, you know, why is this building, you know, doing well? Why is this one not? I, I love looking at problems that, geez, gee, that's strange. I wonder why that is. And uh, feel that if, you know, if I have a, keep a little bit of Jerry Seinfeld wondering about, you ever wonder why people right. do this, you, you can stay fresh. Well, Alan, thank you so much for joining me pleasure. I really enjoyed our conversation. I look forward to chatting again. Absolutely. And thank you listeners for tuning in to The Secret to My Success. 